I felt a sense of urgency and the sense of panic. He was tripping and falling so much. That's never a good sign. I left the room because I couldn't handle it. The sweat glands are gone, and the odor just comes right back. I was devastated. I didn't know how to react. I realized that she does have a serious, serious problem. Next, two medical mysteries that defied the experts. Zach West is a seemingly healthy toddler until he suddenly begins to lose the ability to walk and talk. And no doctor can tell his terrified parents why. I just remember a doctor telling me that there's so many mystery diseases out there that we may never know. And I went into I have to know mode. Then, nothing could have prepared Cheryl Marshall for the bizarre metamorphosis her body would go through when puberty set in. I was this kid in the class who was smelly. So you just end up feeling really bad, embarrassed, humiliated. When illness strikes, we look to doctors to give us answers. But what if they can't? For these unlucky patients, diagnosis is a mystery. In the summer of 2000, Minneapolis natives Rochelle LeCount and her boyfriend, Mike West, were expecting their first child, a boy. We found out what we were having. We had the name Zach picked out from the beginning, and I read all my books to get ready for him to come. On August 25th of that year, Rochelle goes into labor. Eight hours later, they welcome Zach West into the world. When he was born, the nurse was holding him, and I was almost pushing her kind of out of the way so I could count fingers and toes. Once he came, we were his smooth sailing. Hi, Mom. The young parents adore their seemingly perfect son. And even when they end their relationship nine months later, Mike and Rochelle continue to share in the excitement of Zach's progress. I think he started crawling like at seven months and walking around nine, 10 months. And then his first words were right around 11, 12 months. He was up and motoring around. He was good and stable. But a few months after Zach turns one, the young parents notice that his right eye seems to be slightly turned in. And so we went to the doctor, and they thought it was just basically a lazy eye. And she just said he would probably need glasses. But over the next several weeks, it becomes clear that the glasses are not helping. In fact, Zach's eye is turning in even more. On a follow-up visit to their ophthalmologist, the doctor suggests corrective surgery to fix the problem once and for all. It was painful for us because it was the first time that basically anything was going on with him. Though they're terrified at the idea of their child undergoing eye surgery, Mike and Rochelle believe it's the best choice for Zach. You know that this has to be done to help him. But he came out of it really good. By the time he's a year and a half, the eye has healed completely, and the young parents are sure that the worst is behind them. That is, until they realize their son is no longer walking with confidence. He used to walk like he was drunk, and I thought it was just a toddler walk. We were wondering, is it just us, you know, just getting a little excited, you know, being first-time parents, and is this normal, is this not? Just to be safe, Rochelle and Mike take Zach for a checkup with the pediatrician. But instead of reassurance, the doctor offers up an alarming theory. She wanted to rule out muscular dystrophy because his gait was just really unbalanced. Muscular dystrophy is a genetic disorder that over time causes the body's muscles to grow progressively weaker. While there is no cure, it can be managed with various forms of physical therapy. I felt this sense of urgency and the sense of panic. So she sent us to the neurologist. I was hysterical. I mean, I was, I couldn't even breathe. <laughs> it was devastating to us. The neurologist immediately recommends performing further tests to confirm the diagnosis. To test for muscular dystrophy, we did a muscle biopsy. At that point, I, there was lots of tears. I mean, I think we waited like three months for the results. It was a waiting game, and we actually had to keep calling the doctor. They didn't call us to tell us anything. But when Rochelle finally gets the doctor on the phone, he does a complete about face. The muscle biopsy came back normal. He thought that 
Zach just had some difficulties with his coordination and that he would just need some physical therapy and that he'd be all right. He just did not think it was a progressive disease at all. And we were relieved. I mean, we were just thinking, okay, we can handle this. Rochelle begins taking Zach to physical therapy once a week, hoping to get her son back on track. But as the weeks turn into months, the toddler doesn't seem to be showing any significant signs of improvement. He'd have days and sometimes weeks in a row where things were going great, and then other days where he seemed to struggle to maintain trunk control. I always have concerns when you see a child that has developed normally to a certain point and then for some reason starts to lose those skills or show difficulty. That's never a good sign. Sex walking just progressively got more drunken <laughs> is the best way to describe it. And he started losing words at that point. He wasn't saying the words that he once had said. So we kind of knew something more was going on. Desperate for answers, Rochelle takes Zach back to see the neurologist. She demands he help her understand why her son, who could once walk and talk, is continuing to slip away. He could see that Zach was getting worse. He sent us to have an MRI of the spine and of his brain. I kept thinking it was going to get better, but in the back of our mind, we knew that we weren't in the clear. After an anxious 24 hours, the MRI results come in, and the findings are devastating. There are clear signs of brain damage in the cerebellar region of Zach's brain. The cerebellum controls equilibrium and movement of the body, and any damage to this area can cause the brain's signals to get crossed, resulting in poor motor skills and even speech problems. He thought that something environmental happened like the first year of his life and that they just didn't catch it right away. While it's impossible to say for sure, the doctor speculates that an air pollutant or toxic chemical in the local water could have unknowingly caused the damage. The neurologist didn't think it was gonna get much worse, that it was just his skills that needed help with. So we held on to that. We left there going, he's gonna get better. The doctor recommends that Zach continue with regular physical therapy in the hope that in time, he'll begin to regain his strength and coordination. We went to physical therapy one time a week. He actually loved it because they played with him. They worked to try to get him balanced and walking a straight line. We were trying to do everything just to make him progress. It seemed to take him a lot more energy to do some of the things we wanted him to do than it would take the typical child. For a while, it seemed like Zach was stabilizing. And then he just, again, progressively had a harder time walking, harder time with trunk control and hand control and that kind of stuff. The pattern is becoming all too familiar. And when Zach is almost three, Rochelle and Mike decide to get another opinion, this time from a specialist at a well-respected hospital several hours away. At that hospital, they work as teams. That made me feel better to say, great, now we got more than just one person interpreting, you know, and, and maybe they can do some brainstorming. Rochelle and Mike eagerly hand over Zach's hefty file to the team's lead neurologist, hopeful that they'll finally get some answers. She had a couple things in her head, and we did blood work and a urine test. And then she said, if for whatever reason I need you back here, I'll call you. And it was like three days later, we got a phone call that we needed to come right away. So we're like, it's something, they, they figured him out, and we just were not prepared for the answer that she gave us when we were down there. Over the past year and a half, three-year-old Zach West has been slowly losing the ability to walk and talk. But at last, a team of doctors more than 200 miles away believes they've found a critical clue. We got a phone call and we drove down there right away. But as the family walks into the doctor's office, they immediately sense that the news is not good. The neurologist explains that this seemingly simple urine test was positive for a tumor marker. It was like, he, he has cancer. You know, that was the last thing that we ever thought it could be. In fact, the team suspects that Zach has a neuroblastoma, a cancer that forms in nerve tissue. This has most likely been causing his steady muscular decline. The worst cases often result in paralysis. It was tough because you're like, please let it be this so that way at least we have a cure. And then that way at least we know what it is so we know what we can do. 
While the team is confident that a tumor is causing Zach's body to slowly shut down, they need to locate it before coming up with a treatment plan. Usually the neuroblastoma tumor is found in the chest cavity, so they thought that they would do the scans and be able to pinpoint right where it is. And she had test after test ready for us. He had a CAT scan. It was horrible. He had to be awake for it, and they pretty much tied him down, and he just lost it. He freaked out. I left the room because I, I couldn't handle it, and his dad stayed in there with him and held him down. It's instinct, you know, I want to protect him, especially when, when he's that helpless, but now they're asking me to participate with them. It was breaking my heart. But this becomes just one of countless scans that Zach is forced to endure over the next 12 weeks, and each one comes back inconclusive. The neurologist really thought, there has to be a tumor somewhere. But the oncologist wasn't at the same place. He was like, I don't think he has this. So we had two different conflicting doctors at the same clinic saying, yes, he has it, or no, he doesn't have it. Overwhelmed and exhausted, Rochelle and Mike demand to know how the medical team could be so certain that Zach had a tumor just three months earlier and be so unsure of that diagnosis today. The neurologist down there researched it, and there's a regression of neuroblastomas that can happen spontaneously. And so she thought that's what had happened to Zach. That was pretty much the end of it. That was the end of the contact. OK, well, we did what we thought we could do. See you, bye. You're stressed to the max. But again, I felt it was my role not to get upset. Basically, when I was alone, yeah, then, it, then it, it'd crawl up on me, and then you know I'd sit there and I'd have a good cry. There was so many tears, but I needed to make sure that he was living the best life, and I was doing everything I could. No stone left unturned to make sure that he was going to be OK. Not knowing where else to turn, Mike and Rochelle go back to the one person who has actually helped Zach in the past, his physical therapist, Vicki Miles. He was tripping and falling so much. We were really trying as hard as we could to keep him upright and walking and moving. That was really important to mom and dad both. It was frustrating because he couldn't get to the point where he wanted to go. And there would be times where he would just drop to the floor and just start crawling because he just didn't have the energy to do it anymore. We did give him a walker to give him a little bit of additional support and see if we could keep him safe. That worked for a while. I was trying to take video of how bad his walking had gotten at that point, and I was backing away from him. And I think that was probably two months before he completely just stopped walking. Um, so that was one of the last videos I have of him walking ever. It's hard to see that backwards progression. It went from walking to being very wobbly walking, to getting to the point where he couldn't walk. His therapist finally just said, we have to get a wheelchair for him. By August of 2004, Zach is almost four years old, and he's stopped walking altogether. Crushed, Rochelle and Mike begin taking him to a new round of specialists but none can shed any light on Zach's ongoing deterioration. I just remember a doctor telling me that there's so many mystery diseases out there that we may never know, and I went into I have to know mode. For more than two years, Zach West's parents have watched him slowly lose the ability to walk. And when no doctor can explain what's causing his shocking decline, his mother takes matters into her own hands. I would do a ton of researching, and I just went stop. It was a, like a roller coaster, because then I'd be like, I can't put Zach through this anymore. But eventually, Rochelle tracks down a doctor in Illinois who specializes in extremely rare disorders, and he agrees to see them. After thoroughly reviewing their son's history, he suggests a test that Zach has not yet undergone, a spinal tap. At that point, my hopes are up once again that we are going to be able to help him and find a cure for him. For a week, they wait. And when the findings come in, they get the first glimmer of an answer. The spinal tap showed that he had elevated T cells. The doctor explains that T cells help maintain the body's immune system. Any change in the T cell levels 
could indicate that Zach is suffering from an autoimmune disease, a disorder in which the body essentially attacks itself. He just said that he thinks that he has an autoimmune disease, but he doesn't know specifics. He goes on to explain that autoimmune diseases can be either inherited or acquired, but without being able to pinpoint the exact cause of Zach's immune reaction, it's impossible to determine if, in fact, it triggered his decline. He said we could go home and try this IVIG therapy, and if it's an autoimmune disease, it will help Zach. IVIG therapy, or intravenous immunoglobulin therapy, boosts the body's natural response to infection. The whole ride home, it was about a six hour drive. I think I cried the whole way, just because it wasn't the trip that I thought it was gonna be. I thought I was going there for that magic answer and cure for him. The young parents realize that the IVIG is essentially a shot in the dark. There is no guarantee that it will work. But with their options dwindling, they ultimately decide to go ahead with the therapy. We do the infusion every 28 days, and he would go in there and he would be really wobbly. By the second bottle, Zach perks up and you can just tell he feels better. So we were like, he has an autoimmune issue. We're gonna be okay again. <laughs> For the next two years, Zach receives the IVIG therapy every few weeks. Though it's not a cure, the treatment does appear to be slowing the progression of the disease. We just did what we had to do to keep Zach okay, and I really wasn't researching on the internet because Zach had a diagnosis. For the first time in five years, Rochelle and Mike find themselves coming to terms with their son's condition. Little do they know that their world is about to be turned completely upside down. In April of 2007, we did another MRI. And they came in like the cavalry. I just said, uh-oh, you know, something's wrong. And she, I remember she asked me if I was in a good place. And I instantly, I mean, start crying because I'm like, what is she going to tell me? So she told me that his MRI came back and that there was a big change and that he had iron deposits on his brain. This was the first really big, specific finding that pointed them in a specific direction. She goes, I think he has this PKAN, P-K-A-N disease. And I said, are you sure? And she goes, I'm never 100%, but I'm 99% sure. PKAN, or pantothenate kinase-associated neurodegeneration, affects the nervous system and is characterized by muscle rigidity and weakness. An MRI will show an abnormal buildup of iron in specific regions of the brain. It's a very rare progressive disease with no known treatment. I went home and I looked online and I was like, this just doesn't make sense. It didn't look like Zach. The symptoms didn't look like Zach. I Googled brain iron accumulation just to see if there's anything else. And I came across this one website that had this other disease on it. And I about fell off my chair because every little thing was what Zach had. Over the course of the past five years, Rochelle LeCount and Mike West have watched their son Zach slowly regress. Once a vibrant and active child, he's now barely able to move around. And while more than two dozen doctors have failed to explain Zach's deterioration, Rochelle has just discovered a lead online. I found that they just started testing for the gene that causes this disease. I wanted to know more, and I needed to hear from the expert. Her next call is to Dr. Susan Hayflick, one of the leading experts in a disease that was identified just two years ago. The sense I got was that Rochelle was, I think, very obviously striking that critical balance between dogging, getting a diagnosis, and taking really good care of her child. Dr. Hayflick agrees with Rochelle that Zach has many of the classic symptoms of this extremely rare disease. In fact, it is so rare there are less than 10 known cases worldwide. We are one of the world's centers for these disorders all the cases in the U.S. tend to funnel towards us. Dr. Hayflick assures Rochelle that a simple DNA test is all she needs to make the diagnosis. But the family will have to wait an agonizing two months for the results. We've been told so many things that I think I was 
I wasn't going to believe anything. I just wanted a confirmation. My recollection in Zach's situation was having a very high level of confidence that a mutation would be found. And in fact, he has what we would call an atypical neuroaxonal dystrophy. Atypical neuroaxonal dystrophy is a genetic neuromuscular degenerative disorder that essentially cripples the nervous system. It's characterized by a buildup of toxic substances in the nerve endings, known as axonal spheroids, that gradually leads to a progressive decline in a patient's muscular control and ultimately loss of vision. I knew 100%. Now we can figure out what we're fighting. I'd rather know than not know. We don't know specifically how it causes the nerve death, but nerves have anatomy. There's the wiring that goes from one nerve to another nerve to transmit a signal. That's what's happening with the nerves. They're getting uh, bunged up with stuff, and they're not able to transmit the signal in an efficient way. It's clear that whatever is causing the accumulation of this junk is the very process of what's killing the nerves. And the reason why kids with atypical NAD have muscle weakness is that the nerves to the muscles are dying. Kids like Zach have global regression of their development. It's not in any one area, it's across the board. Dr. Hayflick further suspects that Zach's lazy eye was the initial sign of the disorder. We can see that the optic nerve or the, the wiring from the eye to the back of the brain is deteriorating. It's called optic atrophy, and that's seen in a lot of neurologic disorders. The nerve death is the more generalized process that we're seeing in the MRI changes that he showed in the cerebellum. But the iron accumulation that the neurologist found on Zach's brain is harder to explain. The iron accumulation is more of a clue at this stage to get us to a diagnosis. We don't know why it accumulates. And to confuse matters even more, Zach also seems to be suffering from a peculiar autoimmune disorder that is not generally found in patients with NAD. One of the things that was striking to me in this encounter was Zachary has some features that are pretty unusual. He's got this immune abnormality that hasn't been described before in other kids. Zach has already shown us in a number of ways that he's different even from other kids with atypical NAD. It's almost too much for Mike and Rochelle to absorb, but of particular importance to the parents is understanding why so many other doctors had such a hard time putting the pieces of the puzzle together. So what you're getting is a picture of sort of a vague deterioration of the entire nervous system. It's not the only disorder that has that, and so that's part of what makes it really difficult to diagnose. It looks like a lot of other things. The different things this little guy's had to go through, just by us guessing and hoping. I wish we could just take all those things away. But while Mike and Rochelle finally have the answer they've been so desperately seeking, they do not have a cure. In fact, there is no known cure or even treatment for the disease. It's a very, very devastating disease. He's wheelchair bound. He's very limited in his ability to communicate. He will continue that trajectory. Now, people don't die from developmental loss of milestones. They die in these disorders from some complication of neurologic impairment. My biggest fear is that I'm not going to be able to live without him. <laughs> That's mine. He's going to a better place, I know that. But, um, and I just, I don't, I just want him to be okay as for as long as I can have him. At least we're taking a step in the right direction. And I was so thankful for that. You don't feel like you're just lost out at sea on a piece of driftwood. I remember Dr. Hayfly saying to me, if there's any hope I can have you hold on to, it's the fact that they're trying really hard for interventions. Before the gene discovery, we didn't know that this profile that Zachary shows is part of the same disease spectrum. My hope is within the next three to five years, we can understand enough to start to target stages of the disease. And I walked away with that. And it may not be in Zach's lifetime, I mean, but at least they're working on it and it's not a mystery anymore. Today, Zach West is eight years old. While he'll continue to lose muscle control and eventually his ability to talk, Rochelle and Mike are thankful for every day they have together. 
their priority now is living each day to the fullest. I won't have any regrets when it's his time to go because we've done everything we can for him. And we still will continue to do that. Most of all, we're just having fun. We're trying to live life and have fun, and we send him to school because his friends love him there. They have made a tremendous effort to keep Zach active and enjoying things in life. He's just an amazing little boy, and she's an amazing mom. We just try to take day by day. Then again, I looked at Zach, and he's doing really well for having it. So I'm just thankful for that. While Zach West's symptoms appeared when he was only a toddler, Cheryl Marshall had a perfectly healthy childhood. But as soon as puberty struck, so did a bizarre and troubling symptom. Growing up in Toronto during the 1970s, Cheryl Marshall learned early on how to take care of herself. My mother, she was just a very hard worker. She worked the evening shift and the night shift, sometimes a double. Cheryl begins spending all of her free time at school and quickly finds a balance between academics and sports. I was very athletic. I joined the track team and realized that I was good at it. And it was just a great social event. Lots of kids were there. But the summer before starting middle school, Cheryl notices she's sweating more than she used to and has even developed a strange new smell. It was more of a, a musty odor. I mean, we can all imagine if you've been out in the sun, say, doing yard work and you're sweating a lot, it was basically that type of odor. At that time, I was thinking that it was puberty. And when Cheryl heads back to school that fall, her body odor is even worse. Suddenly, kids who were once her friends begin to treat her differently. I could do all the sports, and I, I automatically, I, I would get picked first, and that wasn't the case. Uh, eventually, I was the last one picked. I realized that nobody wanted me on their team. I just feel odd that there's something wrong with you. Ashamed and embarrassed, Cheryl looks to her mother for guidance on how to manage her body's new odor. I can remember my mother saying, well, you know, have you taken your bath yet? not knowing that I had already taken one 15 minutes ago. I didn't put up a fuss, and I just would go ahead and take another bath. I don't think she realized it was a problem. So Cheryl sets about finding her own remedy. I start to think, well, maybe I need to change the deodorant because maybe it's not the right kind. That's how I started tackling the problem. She soon begins dipping into her weekly allowance to experiment with different deodorants. I tried every single one, maybe two or three times. By the end of the year, Cheryl has experimented with more than 20 deodorants and even more soaps and body powders. But none of them help curb the foul smell that seems to follow her everywhere. Mortified, she suffers in silence. I'm not sure if it would have made my school life any easier had I complained to the teacher, or maybe gone home and complained to my mom, but I did not. By the end of middle school, she's spending more and more time alone, as far away as she can get from the incessant ridicule. I remember one incident. This one kid pointed at me with his, his fingers as if you were shooting a gun, and he says, oh, I'm going to blow off your smelly olive pits. So you just end up feeling really bad, embarrassed, humiliated. For the past three years, Toronto native Cheryl Marshall has been emitting a bizarre and intense odor that seems to offend almost everyone she meets. I was this kid in the class who was smelly. It was just a big joke for them. They're not happy memories at all. Maybe if I had gone to my mother, she could have spoken to somebody. And as a parent, as an adult, maybe she could have gotten different answers. But she doesn't want to burden her single mother with yet another problem. So Cheryl does her best to manage the stress all on her own. By the time I got to high school, I was having like a, a mini anxiety attack before class. I would go into class. I would literally not even move. I wouldn't even get up to sharpen a pencil. She's now showering four times a day, but nothing seems to work. At her wit's end, Cheryl finally summons the courage to seek out the help of a doctor. 
I can remember going in to see him and basically telling him that I think there's a problem because I can smell myself even, even if I'm not overly exerting myself. He seemed to understand and he explained that I have hyperhidrosis. Hyperhidrosis is a condition that often begins around the time of adolescence. Patients perspire excessively, regardless of the temperature or their level of stress. While there is no known cure, it can be managed. My family doctor prescribed a very strong deodorant, and I was so excited, and I thought, there's got to work. For the first time in five years, Cheryl is hopeful that she might once again be able to lead a normal life. I followed all the appropriate instructions. He says, cover it with saran wrap. Do that just before you go to sleep. The first night I use it, I did notice, so it does decrease the sweating a little bit, but I had to stop because it was very irritating. It got to the point where the top layer of the skin is just peeled away because it's that strong. Completely disheartened by the experience, Cheryl heads back to her family doctor hoping he can recommend another treatment. My family doctor's next uh, obvious conclusion, you know, she still has a problem, well, let's take out the source of the problem. He explains that the only permanent treatment for hyperhidrosis is to surgically remove her overactive sweat glands. I remember thinking, yay, this is gonna be, this has gotta be it. We're gonna take out the sweat glands and problem solved. Cheryl is terrified of facing surgery but she is more desperate to rid herself of the offensive body odor. I had the surgery and I remember waking up later that day, I had bandages packed under both arms. I was so, so hopeful that, you know, this was the biggest thing I had done to try to solve the problem. I was just thinking from here on in, I'm gonna be able to, you know, do all the things that I've been holding back doing. But after 72 hours, her optimism is suddenly shattered. The odor just comes right back. Oh, the only word for that is devastation. I was devastated because clearly this was not the answer that I was hoping for. There would be not one bead of sweat under either arm. The sweat glands are gone, so why is there still an odor? Dejected and confused, Cheryl resigns herself to living with the noxious odor and spends the next year just getting through each day. Then in June of 1984, she graduates from high school and makes a pivotal decision. Right out of high school, I had wanted to go to nursing school. And I applied and I got accepted and I was to start that September. But I just became a little panicked. Overwhelmed by her condition, Cheryl backs out of school at the last second and gives up her dream of becoming a nurse. But surprisingly, during that same time, another dream is fulfilled without any effort on her part. When I met her, I realized that this person was some totally different, and that in itself was what basically attracted me to her, was the fact that she had her own identity. I was concerned. I didn't discuss it with him at that time. I didn't want to scare him off. <laughs> but on their first date, when Cheryl and Russell are waiting in line to see a film, a fellow moviegoer brings Cheryl's condition front and center. She was standing beside that person, and the way that person looked at her was that smell. I didn't know how to react, you know, if I should yell at the person or say something to defend Cheryl. Horrified by the incident, Cheryl realizes that she has to tell Russell exactly what's going on. I told him, I said, you know, sometimes I may have a little bit of an odor. It wasn't something that I noticed because it, it was something that never bothered me as a potential husband or a date. I think maybe he liked me, and to this day, I think he was just being very polite. Though she's found a man who can see past her problem, Cheryl still feels like a social outcast. As a next step, Russell suggests that she see an internist who might be able to look beyond obvious answers. The doctor did a liver function test because that is a, is a symptom of hepatitis or some kind of liver dysfunction. Cheryl is shocked to hear that she might have contracted such a serious illness. Aside from the odor problem, she's always been completely healthy. The particular test that she did, they all came back fine. The doctor suggests that Cheryl is suffering from severe bromhydrosis, commonly known as smelly sweat. While the specific cause is unknown, 
Experts tend to believe that when certain body chemicals interact with bacteria on the skin's surface, stubborn forms of extreme body odor can occur. That diagnosis, I thought that's what it was. It was something to say, well, this is what I have. You're happy when somebody gives you a name of something. And that one made the most sense as opposed to hyperhidrosis. While there is no cure, it can be managed with topical antibiotic treatments. With a diagnosis in hand, Cheryl feels confident enough to accept Russell's marriage proposal that spring. And soon after their 1988 wedding, Cheryl feels ready to pursue her long postponed dream, nursing school. I just decided, I said to Russ, I'm gonna do this. It was a little hard. Now you're going to school with adults and certainly they're not gonna be teasing you like I was when I, <laughs> when I was in middle school. But I still had to muster the courage every day to go to class. Cheryl graduates in 1992 and the couple soon moves to Florida where she begins working at a local hospital. It's a chance for a fresh start, but Cheryl remains apprehensive and it isn't long before an all too familiar pattern begins to emerge. When I first met her, she stayed more to herself. She didn't really hang around people. Over the years, I've grown an armor around me, but every so often there's a little crack in that armor. We worked at a nursing facility and the people that worked under her used to say she smelled and that it was her hygiene. Like if someone worked out and hadn't showered a baby yet. She would come home and you can see that something is bothering her. At that point, I realized that she does have a serious, serious problem. Though Cheryl does her best to ignore the hurtful comments, inside, she is boiling over. It's become painfully obvious that some of these mean kids that I went to school with, these are just the bigger versions of them. <laughs> and they're gonna embarrass me. And I thought, oh no, I'm not going to take this. For more than 20 years, Cheryl Marshall has been living with a socially crippling disease that causes her to emit a stomach-churning odor, and no doctor seems to know how to manage it. Eventually, you get to the point where I don't want to see another doctor. So Cheryl decides to take matters into her own hands. Using her medical training as a guide, she begins a full-on investigation into a range of different diseases and conditions. Then, in the summer of 2005, she's surfing the web when suddenly she strikes gold. I was doing online research and I came upon this support group. There must have been about 4,000 posts. When I started reading all these people's different experiences, it was just like somebody had just flipped the light on. I kept on reading and kept on reading and I came upon Dr. Fennessy's name. The following morning, Cheryl contacts Dr. Paul Fennessy at his office in Colorado. She's a pretty tenacious lady trying to uncover the cause of this disorder. In 1970, our group first detected this disease. Right now, there's only a handful of laboratories in the world that are even looking at this disorder. He explains that his team has created a simple urine test that can confirm if she's indeed suffering from this extremely rare disease. We give you a kit, then we collect urine for the next 24 hours and we measure that urine for the amount of trimethylamine. Trimethylamine is a chemical created in the intestines during the digestive process. It is then transported to the liver to be broken down and excreted in the urine. I was very nervous because if it was negative, it would be practically back to square one. And <laughs> then what? Cheryl completes the test and ships her samples off to Dr. Fennessy's lab. She then spends the next two months struggling to keep her expectations low. I remember saying to Russ, I said, well, what if this comes back and this is not it? You know, I said, then what? Because I need to know. This is driving me crazy. This has been 30 years now. I mean, it's been 30 years, literally. When we looked at her sample, she turned out to have just about a 50-50 ratio of trimethylamine to trimethylamine oxide. And so it's clear that her enzymes are not functioning correctly. So that's the trimethylaminuria. Trimethylaminuria, also known as TMAU, is a rare metabolic disorder in which the liver fails to process the chemical trimethylamine, which can often smell like rotting fish. 
Over time, the chemical builds up in the body, causing patients like Cheryl to excrete a strong and offensive odor. Any way it can get out, it gets out. If you think about how volatile and how pungent ammonia is, trimethylamine is like, ammonia, it goes through the body and come out every single pore, and then ends up causing people around to notice very quickly that there's something awry, and it's oftentimes perceived as offensive. The symptoms can occur sporadically, and while most people associate the odor with a fish-like smell, others do not. Everyone has a slightly different nasal interpretation of what they're sensing. I don't really smell a fish odor that causes me to cry, sort of like you're cutting an onion. When I realized what was wrong with me, it was vindication for all those years, those decades of not knowing and being misdiagnosed and led down the wrong path. I was happy, happy that I knew what was wrong with me. And while she's relieved that the diagnosis carries with it no risks to her overall physical health, she continues to struggle with the psychological side effects of this disorder. It doesn't surprise me at all that social stigma and, and social depression are a major part of this disorder. And on top of that, the frustration of not knowing why is even worse because someone says, you know, you stink and you can't tell them why. And that's a horrible burden to drag through life. The feelings of humiliation and shame that so many TMAU patients experience is all too familiar to Cheryl. But she's having a harder time understanding why so many doctors failed to figure out her case. After talking to other people with the same disorder, they have been through the same thing. Doctors thinking they're nutty, crazy. They were doing as much as they possibly could with what they had. The first textbook that I've seen written describing trimethylamine was in 2006 or seven. And so that's the very first time that this has really actually entered the medical teaching literature. But the diagnosis is bittersweet. There is no known cure or treatment for TMAU. However, Dr. Fennessy assures Cheryl that it's still possible to live a relatively normal life by adjusting her diet. This disease is really uh, driven by the things that you eat and the things you eat a lot of. One of the worst offenders would be eggs. If you ate nothing but eggs for uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you're gonna smell to high heaven. Other foods high in trimethylamine include legumes, meat, and dairy. In fact, Dr. Fennessy is so confident that the disease can be triggered by diet that he suspects her first episode 30 years ago was induced by the food she was eating at the time. We'll talk about a teenager as being a free grazer, that they go out and pick foods that they actually like and not the ones that mom and dad would normally feed them but it actually has a tremendous amount of the precursors for trimethylamine in it. So this causes a disease that was there all the time to all of a sudden become very noticeable. Today, Cheryl keeps the odor in check by paying close attention to the food that she brings into the house. <laughs> her diet's really changed. I love fish, uh, but that's one of the problems, food for her. Now we don't eat any at all. God bless him, I love him so much. He is so supportive. He has, he has stuck with me through this whole thing. But more than anything, the diagnosis has given Cheryl the courage to face the world without shame. I think now she seems more positive and now that she's actually taken the bull by the horn. I've had to do a lot of this really on my own because doctors just did, they just didn't know. I want to put that behind me. I think it's made me a stronger person.